Uh, what we're going to look at today, we're going to look at the business of malware, and it is very much a business. Uh, I'll try and demonstrate that to you. We'll look at how it's been dealt with, we'll look at uh, our pedigree, um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So, the business of malware. What's changed? We'll have a look at uh, the landscape as it was 10-15 years ago and we'll look at the landscape now and you'll see there, there have been some major changes. Uh, we'll look at uh, who are they? Who is actually producing the malware? Uh, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? Where do they come from? How do we combat it? Uh, we'll look at the possible consequences of inadequate protection as well. If you go back 10-15 years ago, we only had viruses. Viruses were written by nerdy little teenagers in their bedroom just because they could and they thought it would be a bit of fun. Uh, that has changed very much. We still have the computer nerds actually producing viruses in their bedroom for a bit of fun, but uh, very much in the minority now. Organised crime. That's where most of the malware comes from now. Uh, we've got the gangsters there, but obviously we've moved on from there. We've got people like the Russian Mafia. We've got uh, criminal organisations worldwide. Brazil and Europe, uh, Eastern Europe in particular, infamous for phishing attacks. They're banking specialists. They're the people that send you the emails purporting to be from your bank, saying somebody's uh, compromised your account or there's a problem with your account. Log in here, put your uh, web ID, your username and password in, and we'll sort that out for you. Uh, of course, it's rubbish. Uh, once they have your username and password, they'll empty your bank account. That's the way it works. Um, it's surprising the amount of people that do actually get taken in by this. Uh, some people that you would have thought <laughs> would have known better. Um, businessmen, people that run businesses, um, but predominantly it's the home users. It's the home users that are not educated, they're not aware of the risk. They see an email purporting to be from Lloyds Bank, they, they've got an account with Lloyds Bank, they think, oh, I've got a problem. So they click on the link. The most interesting link I've ever seen, if, if you hover your mouse over the link that you have to go to, to put your username and password in, it will be nothing to do with the bank whatsoever. And the funniest one I've ever seen was hovering over a link and it said, we're going to steal your money, dot ru. So that was the Russians. Um, from China, we've got uh, military espionage, we've got key logging. Uh, the Russian Mafia, they're infamous for botnets and denial of service. Uh, West Africa, we've got the advanced fee fraud or the 419 scams as they're known in the industry. Um, I'm, I'm assuming most of you have had uh, an email from uh, somebody in Africa saying that you've inherited millions of pounds. Um, and to, to get your hands on those millions of pounds, you actually have to pay them money. That's why it's called an advanced fee fraud. Uh, they keep taking money off you until finally you get the message. Uh, and uh, obviously you're never going to get your hands on any of those millions because they don't actually exist. Uh, you get lots of variations on that type of fraud. Um, it's either you've inherited money or somebody's trying to um, launder money from an African state uh, that's been tucked away sitting in a bank account somewhere. Uh, they're, they're all frauds. We have a number of global forums and sites. Um, one in particular that uh, most, most people in the industry are aware of is something called Dark Market. Um, I'll, I'll touch on Dark Market with a little story as we move on. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, Dark Market um, was or is uh, a, a global forum. It's an English-speaking forum and it's particularly related to cybercrime. So if you want to make contact with somebody that can help you um, actually produce a scam of some sort, they will put you in touch with the right people who can give you the technology to do that. Uh, Dark Market as well also has a recruitment area. Uh, so there is a, a black market for recruitment where the organised crime uh, bosses are actually recruiting some very, very talented IT guys to actually write malware. So obviously to combat that we have to recruit very, very cute people ourselves. Uh, so there's all that stuff going on behind the scenes that a lot of people are not actually aware of. 
We've got social media now, uh, Facebook, Twitter uh, and the like. Uh, even that's a risk. You've got, with Facebook, we actually ran an exercise internally ourselves. And through looking, uh, we, we created a, a, a dummy account on Facebook. And we put regular posts through it. Uh, yeah, just off to the bank now, um, going to uh, Gino's uh, Italian restaurant for dinner tonight. Um, and you can actually build up a picture of what that person does. And you can build up a picture to the point that you know they go on holiday in the same two weeks every year. So if you know they're on holiday in those two weeks every year, it's not difficult to find out what the address is and then go and burgle them because you know there's not going to be anybody in. Um, we've also had instances of uh, people contacting, uh, hacking accounts and contacting people saying that um, uh, they, they are a friend of that particular individual or somebody that they know and uh, I'm, I'm stuck overseas, I've had my credit card stolen, I uh, desperately need some cash, can you, can you send me some cash over? And people, people fall for it. Um, eBay, you've constantly got... Uh, people purporting to be from eBay saying there's a problem with your account and the same thing again they get your username and password they've now got access to your eBay account and they can use that for a variety of reasons um, the phishing attacks from banks uh, working in the industry I actually get to see an awful lot of these and apparently I've got uh, because my email address is in the public domain uh, I've actually got probably about 20 different accounts worldwide that I didn't even know I had. But I must have them because they keep sending me emails saying there's a problem with your account, log in here, put your username and password in and we'll sort it out. Um, I've even got an account with Wells Fargo. So. The threat landscape has very much changed. Uh, gone are the days when all we had were viruses written by computer nerds in their bedroom. Uh, those days have gone. Um, th they still do it, but it's uh, very much uh, a minimal exercise now. The vast majority of malware is coming from other sources. No longer just viruses. We have uh, top left there, we have uh, the Trojan horse. Uh, your Trojan is obviously something that is hidden within another application or another piece of code um, that does something nasty. And uh, Trojans, they, they will try various methods to trick you into installing a piece of code where that is hidden inside. Uh, you've got your phishing attacks, which we've already spoken about. Phishing attacks, uh, generally speaking, they're after your bank details, your credit card details. Uh, they're after your eBay account details. They're even after your e ISP details. Because if they can get access to your ISP account, they can use your account to send out spam email. Now what happens then is, all of a sudden your email's not working, you phone your ISP and they said, well we suspended your account because you sent uh, 20,000 spam emails. No I didn't. Yes you did. Uh, so obviously they, they know this goes on and most, most people are completely innocent and they get their account reinstated with a new username and password. Um, quite often you get a, a, an email from your um, what appears to be your ISP saying somebody sent you some pictures click here log in and you can view the pictures and of course there aren't any pictures but you've then given them your username and password uh, we've also now got worms worms uh, just sit in the background and nibble away at the edges of your data uh, so they're quite harmful uh, traditional viruses we have on the, the left hand side there uh, here we have key loggers so the key loggers, basically a key logger, if that's installed on your computer, it logs your keystrokes. So it can pick up all your passwords, your usernames, uh, it can pick up um, uh, other details on bank accounts, credit cards, etc. So they're, they're quite nasty. Uh, we've also got uh, root kits, which, which have appeared more recently. Um, when I say more recently, um, over the last 10 years. Uh, root kits... Um, uh, basically are hidden pieces of, of code that sit within your computer and they basically transmit information that you don't want them to. Uh, there was a famous case a few years ago that Sony had a, a rootkit embedded in their CDs. Uh, so basically when people were playing those on a computer, the rootkit kicked in. Uh, they got a slap wrist for that, I believe. 
And what else have we got? We've got uh, hackers. Now obviously for hackers, if you've got a decent firewall installed, that will prevent hacking. Uh, but hackers are trying to get control of your computer, again, so that they can take information from it or use your computer for their own means. Uh, you've got things like fake antivirus. Fake antivirus, basically you get a pop-up saying that um, this particular antivirus program, which you hadn't installed, by the way, has discovered a load of threats on your computer. If you pay us $50, we'll sort that out for you. Of course, not only have you given them $50, you've given them your credit card details. Uh, so that's another one to, to look out for. If you haven't installed that program yourself, how the hell can it know that you've got all those threats? It can't, and generally there aren't any threats. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, a con, it's a scam. We've got the, I expect most of you have been on a website at some point and you've had a pop-up saying that you've won an iPad or you've won something uh, or the other. Uh, again, that's a scam. Once you click on it, uh, you are leaving yourself open to all sorts of threats. <coughs> We've got spyware. We've got adware. We've got uh, industrial espionage as well, and government espionage, looking for secrets. Um, this is going back to June this year, so it's fairly recent. Um, the virus uh, ACAD Medra A has stolen tens of thousands of blueprints from companies, mostly in Peru. Um, said he said, said us. Uh, basically, they targeted uh, a, a computer-aided design program called AutoCAD, uh, which you may or may not be aware of. Um, basically, they had um, uh, an infected template that had got out into the wild, and people thought it was a genuine template, and they'd been using this. And of course, once they'd used this template, it actually kicked in, uh, uh, it kicked in a, a piece of software that transmitted that information, all those blueprints back, to addresses in China. So we're assuming that it was the Chinese that were stealing these, these blueprints. Um, and this could have been for anything from uh, a, a mechanical engineering design to an architect's design. So anything where a, a computer-aided design program is used. And <coughs> this actually uh, resulted in ESET working quite closely with the Chinese authorities and various other uh, authorities to try and get to the bottom of it. Uh, the perpetrators were never actually caught, um, but at least we put a stop to the, the actual uh, events of these blueprints being sent to China. So that's, that's industrial espionage on quite a grand scale. So why are they doing all this? It's mainly financially driven. They're, they're looking for data. They're looking to steal your usernames and passwords, your bank account details. Uh, that's where, where they're mainly concentrated. Uh, you've got politically driven uh, malware through Russia, China, the Middle East. Uh, that's for a, a number of political reasons. Uh, we've all heard about the oppression, um, uh, freedom of speech, etc. in some of these countries. Uh, and they will actually target a particular country and they can, they can take down their computer networks and stop them doing certain things or stop them actually telling the rest of the world what's happening through computer means. We've got intellectual property rights theft as we've already seen, the industrial espionage that I've just mentioned, but generally speaking follow the money. It's all about money and these criminal organizations worldwide are actually making millions. They're working on the, on the principle that if you throw enough crap against the wall, some of it's going to stick. Uh, so they will target hundreds of thousands of people. If only five of those people fall for it, and they can clear their bank accounts or get their credit card details, or get their ISP details and use their computer for sending out spam and phishing attacks, um, that's, that's where it, it, it all stems from. Uh, so follow the money, and you'll soon find out what's happening. So how is it combated? Um, this, this is a particularly nice story. I was actually at um, uh, an e-crime conference in London where this guy actually spoke. Uh, so J. Keith Mulaski, Supervisory Special Agent, Cyber Division, FBI. Uh, he actually went deep undercover and he set himself up with an alias. It was uh, Master Splinter. 
and uh, basically he infiltrated Dark Market, which was the uh, the cyber crime cyber crime uh, forum that I mentioned earlier, and he got um, he got quite well in with the guys that were running this and uh, they were bemoaning the fact that the authorities kept taking down their servers. So he said, well I've got some really secure servers, they haven't been able to touch me yet. I could actually run your stuff through my servers if you want. Okay then. So by this time they trusted him enough to do that and what actually happened was they just spent six months gathering evidence and then at the end of that they arrested 60 people worldwide. So I thought that was quite clever. Uh, very, very interesting listening to, to that guy talk. Uh, how do we combat it? Uh, the antivirus industry. Well, we had one particular instance where uh, a, a Russian crime organization had produced uh, some malware and it was quite prevalent. It was causing people a lot of problems. And what actually happened was they'd produce it, we'd find it, we'd, find it, we'd create a fix for it. So that's all lovely. As soon as we created a fix for it, they then release a, a new version, which was a, a variation of the original, but enough of a variation that you couldn't detect it uh, generically. So we then had to com completely refix it, if you like, come up with another signature uh, to combat it, and then they produced a new version. We came up with a fix, they produced a new version. Uh, so we, we had this game of um, tennis, if you like, going backwards and forwards, futuristic tennis, and eventually they gave up. Um, but the work that that actually involved was horrendous. Um, and these guys, as I mentioned, because they're making so much money from cybercrime, they're paying some very, very clever IT guys, some young guys, uh, to write this malware and they're paying them lots of money to do it. Our virus labs in Slovakia, we see tens of thousands of new malware samples on a daily basis. Tens of thousands on a daily basis. That's horrendous. So most of us are, are quite lucky if we've got decent antivirus software, we manage to stop most things. Um, we have to employ top talent as well. Uh, because the malware producers are empl employing top talent and they're paying them a lot of money. So we have to work with that. Um, we, we had a, an interesting uh, recruitment program in Slovakia where our head office is in Bratislava. Uh, they put up billboards with a piece of code. Uh, basically it said in Slovakian, if you can reverse engineer this piece of code, we're interested in talking to you about becoming a virus researcher and if you can reverse engineer this code you'll find the details of how to apply. Uh, so th that was quite clever and they, they knew they were getting the right calibre of people. So what are the possible consequences of inadequate detection and being hit by a virus? Well we've got an example here, these are taken from US figures and all I've done is used the exchange rate and just rounded them up. So we've got a 500 user organisation, uh, they've been hit by um, a piece of malware which is causing them problems and we're only talking about three hours downtime here. Three hours. Uh, the cost to that organisation potentially is £14,000. So 500 user organisation, three hours, that's lost productivity, the cost of putting it right. Now that can really hit a business badly if it's happening more than once. If you're using antivirus software that is not particularly the best and it's letting viruses in, uh, or worms or trojans or anything else that's going to cause you problems, um, then effectively you could be hit several times a year. So multiply 14,000 by several. Uh, I'm sure you guys can do the maths. You've also got additional hidden costs. Um, if you sell your products or your services through your website, if that's not able to happen, those customers are going to go to your competition. So potentially you've lost money there as well. So if the network goes down once a year for three hours, that's the potential cost. If it goes down several times a year, that can be quite nasty. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers seeing this in the news or hearing about it. Uh, St Bart's Hospital in London, uh, they form an NHS trust with the Royal London Hospital and the London Chest Hospital. They were actually hit by the mitob worm 
which took down all three hospitals' computer networks over a two-day period. Now, bearing in mind what I've just said about the cost of three hours downtime, this was a couple of days. Now, if that, been, if, if that had been a commercial organisation, that could have hit them quite badly. Um, but it's okay, it's NHS Trust, so taxpayers' money paid to put that right. We paid for that. Um, the thing that's more of concern here is that what they got hit by was not an unknown threat. It was a known threat, which all the top antivirus companies say, oh yes, we know all about that, we've got a signature for it, we can stop that. Uh, I won't mention what they were using, <coughs> McAfee. Uh, they were using McAfee, um, which missed it, and as a consequence of that, it caused a lot of disruption and a lot of taxpayers' money to put it right. So what can you do? Uh, ensure you're using best of breed protection. Uh, look for the best technology, not necessarily the biggest brand name, and certainly not, not price. Uh, if you're buying on price, the chances are you're not going to be buying best of breed. Uh, research a product's pedigree. Uh, look at their test results. Look at independent test results, not stuff they've produced in-house. And if you can see that a product does well consistently over a period of time, then you can be fairly assured that that is a good product and that's going to give you best level of protection. Um, more than that, be aware, be circumspect and encourage that with your employees. It's all very well for you to have um, uh, employees working on computers and um, if you, for instance, if you've not got uh, malware being stopped at your exchange mail server, uh, but it's okay because you've got antivirus on the endpoints. What happens if a virus comes in to the end user and it's uh, little Jackie down in the counts and whoa, you've got a virus. Hmm, wonder what will happen if I do open that. Or click the wrong thing. Depends how you've got it configured. Um, there, there is a potential there for people to actually cause problems internally. Um, I mentioned test results, and this is this is where I do the uh, the sell. Um, in terms of test results, um, consistently over a 14-year period, uh, we have more virus bulletin VB100 awards than any other product. Now, the criteria for passing these tests is one, if you miss an in-the-wild virus, which is a known virus, you fail. If you produce a single false positive, which is a false alarm saying you've got a virus when you haven't, uh, you fail. Simple as that. Uh, we've only ever failed one test and that was for false positive and that was back in 2000. Now, remember when I was talking about St. Bart's Hospital, NHS Trust, and I was saying that what they got hit by was a known piece of malware. And McAfee should really have been able to stop that, as should all the big brand names. So you would expect that the instances of uh, all the top brands missing in the wild viruses are fairly low. ESET, uh, we're, we're the only company that has never ever missed an in-the-wild virus in these tests. And that's in 14 years of testing. It was over 14 years now. Uh, we've just picked up a, another VB100 award, which I only heard about yesterday, so I hadn't updated the figures. Um, but you look at some of the others there, and uh, AVG, GData, Avira, they're all recognised as known brands and they're all quite respected in the industry as being half-decent products. We couldn't even fit them on the, on the scale. We actually had to truncate the figures. But these are known viruses that are being missed. So it's not new, something new and unknown that nobody's ever seen before. These are known viruses that all these companies say they have signatures for that will stop those viruses or worms or trojans or whatever. Um, so that's, that's quite scary reading, I think. What gives us the right to stand here and talk about the malware industry? Um, we have over 20 years of experience in protecting uh, digital worlds. 
established in 1992, flagship product Nod32 antivirus released in 98. Uh, we pioneered and we continue to lead the industry in heuristics technology and that's the ability to spot new malware at zero hour. So we can look at a piece of code or an application and say, right, this is nasty. We're not quite sure exactly how it works yet or what it does, but we know it's nasty from certain characteristics. We're going to stop it now. We'll worry about a signature later. So from that point of view, that's a, a bit of a head start. Um, we have over 130 million users worldwide, rapidly increasing. Uh, and I think I've already mentioned we're the only antivirus product to have never missed an in-the-wild virus in virus bulletin testing. Um, we also have the highest number of Advanced Plus AV Comparatives Awards. Again, independent third-party organisation. Um, their testing is quite interesting. What they do is they take all the, the major antivirus products and they purposely don't update them for three months. And after that three months, they then show them all the malware that's been uh, released into the wild during those three months and say, well, OK, you've got no signatures for this. Let's see how good you are at proactive detection. Um, we have more of their Advanced Plus Awards than any other product. In terms of companies that use us, um, you'll see some familiar names there. Microsoft is the one that always surprises people. Uh, Microsoft have got their own antivirus solution, surely. Yes, they have. They've been using our software in their pre-release labs for the last 11 years, and they're still a customer to this day. I have no doubt they use a couple of other products, um, but that shows the respect they have for, for ESET in the industry. Uh, some familiar names here in the, in the UK. Again, I won't push those too much. Awards and certifications, uh, again this is important to look at. Um, does the, the product that you're looking to purchase to protect your endpoints, does it have awards and certifications to say that it's a good product? Uh, so things you need to look for, things like ICSA Labs certified, uh, West Coast Labs checkmark certified, uh, awards and certifications from AV test, from AV comparatives, from virus bulletin, um, we're VMware ready certified, Citrix ready certified. That's another concern. A lot of people are going down the virtual route now as well. Um, of course, everybody's talking about the cloud. That's the big inward at the moment. Just a, a couple of other awards there. Again, I won't harp on those too much. Um, one of the other considerations when you're looking at antivirus software, uh, the antivirus software has got a reputation uh, for slowing your computer or slowing your networks down because it's very heavy on system resource, um, it's, it has quite a large system footprint. We actually bucked the trend a little bit there. Um, what's happened traditionally over the years is as we've had new threats added to the landscape, people have said, well, we need protection for this as well now. And instead of integrating that into one fully integrated engine, they bolt something on. So with some products, you could actually be running several applications at the same time. And that, to a certain extent, is where you get the heavy system footprint from. Um, we managed to keep everything integrated into one engine, which helps. So you'll see uh, a, a lower memory consumption there across a variety of third-party independent testing. And again there, memory consumption. Time it takes to run a full system scan memory usage during full system scan, daily network traffic, and again, we do very well in all those areas. Server memory usage during on-demand scan, slowdown caused by antivirus solutions, again, from an independent third-party organization. Uh, this is for an org organization called Passmark Laboratories in uh, Australia. Again, independent testing, and you can see how the various products shape up. Um, Microsoft, Microsoft say, well, yes, we'll give you free protection. And they're doing that quite a lot in the public sector and in education. Um, that's why it's free. It doesn't actually do very much. That's a more recent one. The previous one was from 2010. This is from August 2012, so bang up to date. And you can see Microsoft have improved their game slightly in certain areas, um, but still not enough to make it uh, a valid product, we don't think. Okay, Alan, thank you very much indeed. Okay.